Um, I welcome all of you at this panel. I'm glad that you all came, even though it is the second last slot of this conference, I guess, and it's again a panel discussion. Um, in this panel, we want to discuss about uh, platform cooperativism and free software as two movements who, uh, which are aiming at a transformation of the digital realm. Um, though both movements seem to share, at least in part, um, similar transformative goals, uh, which we will explore in detail shortly. Um, our ob observation is that, in practice, there are only few examples of organizations combining both approaches. Um, within this panel, we would like to talk about possible reasons for that. So, do, do both, both movements really aim at similar transformation? Or are there maybe even contradictions between them? And how can both approaches help each other in fulfilling their goals? So those and other questions uh, we want to discuss today with our guests. We will start with a discussion on the panel only, and afterwards there will be time left for um, questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, keep them in mind or write it down for um, the last part. Um, before we want to start the discussion, um, I want to point out that there's uh, obviously some uh, gender imbalance on our panel. Um, we as the organization team, so us, um, are aware of that and find that a bit problematic. And um, we would have liked to have a bit more diverse representation of the field. Um, nevertheless, um, I'm very glad about our speakers and um, thank you very much for coming. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward for an interesting discussion with you. Yes, hello. Also from my side, um, my name is Jonas Pensin. Uh, me and my colleague Clara, uh, we work at the Institute for Ecological Economy Research. And before we get into the discussion, I briefly want to introduce to you uh, the three speakers who have uh, gladly decided to join us today. Uh, on my very left is uh, Felix, Felix Veet, um, who is the founder of uh, Fairmondo, which is an, an online marketplace, an online cooperative, which functions in a, in a similar fashion to, to Amazon and eBay. But the biggest difference is they're entirely owned by their users. And um, during his studies, um, he has focused a lot uh, on democracy research and questions of anti-corruption. And this academic interest, uh, coupled with the practical experience at the German uh, Corporation for International Cooperation and at the Transparency International Foundation, has informed the idea of Fermondo. So the idea, as he claims it to be, it's to build a corruption-resistant company that helps transforming our economy from the bottom up. And today, Felix focuses primarily on the internalization, internationalization of this project. So thanks a lot to you for being here, Felix. Um, on my left, um, we have Alexandre Segura, uh, who has been working as a web, uh, web developer for uh, more than 10 years now. And um, he hasn't studied computer science, but he says that he's always loved computers, especially because he used them to produce music. And uh, he's self-taught. Um, he always learned by doing things, uh, just by doing them for himself. And he has described to us that um, the Nuit Debout movement, so he's from, from Paris, France, the Nuit Debout movement, uh, which started in, in France in 2016, and which was then followed by protests against the labor law reform that were proposed by then President Francois Hollande, um, it was a pivotal moment in his life. Because before he was always sympathetic towards um, leftist and political ideas, but he was never an activist himself. But Nuit Debout changed this. Um, he got in contact with a lot of people that actively wanted to change the world. And without Nuit Debout, he says, co-op cycle, which is what he will present to us today, a cooperative also, wouldn't have existed. So we're very curious to find out how exactly co-op cycle helps making the world a better place. And last but not least, to my right, we have uh, Silvan. Uh, Silvan is a computer linguist who has studied in Potsdam. And um, he is a volunteer for the FSFE, the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, for six years now, since 2012, and he is active for them locally in Berlin as well as uh, German-wide. And um, he is a software developer as a profession and a free software advocate in his free time. So we're very much looking forward to what he does in his free time. Um, thanks to all three of you again, and uh, we're looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Welcome also to the people who've joined a little bit later. Um, so my first question, and I would like to extend this question to all of you one after another, is um, Clara has outlined these uh, two strategies in the beginning, so kind of cooperativism on the one hand and free software on the other. And the first very broad question that I would, I would first like to, to give to you, Felix, is which of these strategies does Fermondo actually use and, and why? Okay. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for being here. Um, 
So for Mondo, obviously, is a platform cooperative. That's our main characteristic. That's what we started off with, of creating an online marketplace that is owned by its users and by its employees and basically all affected stakeholders. But then, um, during the... Well, during the founding phase of Fermondo, we also had a lot of developers um, or some developers joining our team. And they proposed to create our own software and to do it open source or as a free software. And that was a bit of a discussion, but after I was quickly convinced, I had no idea about open source before. But uh, um, my first question was like, isn't this uh, dangerous? Aren't we opening up to risks of someone hacking our software, knowing the code and so on. And they basically said, no, it's the other way around, it's going to be more secure. So, um, well, that's one of the reasons why we chose it, but during the time of developing Fermondo and as a business and as a project, we re realized that there are a lot of advantages about open source and by now I see myself as a little free software activist too. <laughs> Just recommending this to many people and also saying that we we need more free software as a strategy for recapturing the internet as a democratic space um, for people to get active and to, to own themselves. Thanks. So on this side there is a there is a connection already between free software and uh, platform cooperativism. Um, how is it for you, um, Alex? Um, how does co-op cycle deal with these two strategies? Do you address both of them or just one of them? Uh, yes, uh, we uh, we use both of them or two uh, because uh, co-op cycle is uh, trying to be to bring uh, an, an alternative to uh, like you uh, towards Amazon and it's trying to build an alternative towards uh, food delivery uh, platforms employing. Uh, so, gig economy workers, so like uh, Deliveroo or Foodora, Uber Eats. I, I, I don't really like to, to, to say their name, but uh, that's more uh, understandable sometimes. Um, and uh, so, the project started as a pure uh, technology project because it started as a a side project that I started, I started uh, myself. It was uh, not really, with no, no real plan at the beginning. Uh, so it, it was uh, uh, not really serious. Uh, it, it was uh, put in, um, uh, it was put on GitHub uh, almost uh, immediately when it, uh, it started. So it, maybe it started first as a, I don't know, open source free software uh, project. And then uh, the, 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 the cooperative idea uh, came maybe a little bit later. Uh, and it came uh, with, uh, as, a, as a solution uh, to replace uh, gig economy work. So, uh, because the, 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 the big platform, they are, uh, of the gig economy, they are employing, they are, not employing, they are using they are uh, using uh, contractors, so which have no uh, social security, no uh, rights as workers. They are just um, obeying to some kind of algorithm, uh, and so we the the the, the cooperative uh, strategy is on our uh, on our project is used as a. A complete uh, in the complete opposite side of uh, gig economy work and self-employment. So uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we 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 use both strategies. I would say, and even of course in the because for me, uh, free software open source is also a way to uh, organize communities to organize. Uh, uh, non hierarchical uh, hierarchical structures uh, of work where everybody is on the same uh, level there is no no boss uh, even in in, uh, in in open source and uh, free software community that's not maybe the case for all open source community like maybe Linux is a little bit uh, pyramidal uh, structure but uh, uh, I think uh, also free software is uh, so both uh, strategies are feeding each other. I think. 
So we've heard here on the left that um, both of them are very much interested in the, in the discussion around free software. Um, both of them are also interested in the question of cooperativism. Now, what do you and the FSFE think about this? And maybe a bit more controversial, do you think they're right when they're saying that um, they are, to a certain extent, also free software activists? Uh, well, I, I don't know if, if they are free, free software activists or not. I hope they are, but uh, I can't assess that. Um, but when thinking about uh, what position to take on this panel here from a free software uh, point of view, uh, I figured that there are basically two, uh, two options. I have a choice uh, to make between two options. One is a rather easy way of focusing on free software as a tool, as, as a means. And, and there's an, uh, that, that would be the easy, rather cowardice uh, way of saying, okay, here's a tool that you are free to use <clears throat> and you can make a choice to use it or not and that takes me out of the equation because the choice is up to you and I can happily hack away my free software and, uh, and, and not decide anything. And uh, the other uh, way that I could choose to take a position on is to focus on free software not as, as a tool, as a means, but rather on the free software movement and the, and the ends or the, the social goals that we are trying to achieve by um, advocating or even producing free software. And that's, uh, that's a more difficult and a, a little more courageous uh, way because um, here I, I have to say what, what goals do we have um, by producing free software and, and again I think I have an offer to make or the free software community has an offer to make. There's, uh, there's one, uh, the freedom that we are trying uh, to achieve by using uh, free software, the freedom to use, to study, to share and to improve uh, your software. And I think the other aspect that I would like to focus on there, probably there are many more, but the other um, aspect is self-determination, right? Self-determination in terms of how do we control our software that we use in everyday life and how do we control the devices um, that uh, we use every day and how do we prevent them, the devices and the software, to control us. And uh, that's an interesting uh, discussion I think that we're trying uh, to make. So I will try and choose the, the more complex and complicated way of focusing on the ends. And uh, I hope that everyone who doesn't agree on the ends that I am pro proposing here um, will understand that uh, the free software movement is a very heterogeneous uh, movement. Yeah, thank you very much for um, outlining those goals and ends. Um, so um, now I would like to ask you as platform cooper cooperativist um, founders or members, um, do you see any similarities between those goals and ends Silvan just outlined and the goals of the platform cooperativism movement or your cooperative um, specifically? Okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, there are some, some similar goals and I think um, some, some major goals that we all probably would kind of sign up to. Um, democracy, freedom, um, not being controlled by our own devices, not being controlled maybe by some large corporations and their specific targets. Then, um, when it comes down to, to all day practice and um, to what we actually do, um, I think there, there are some challenges of aligning our strategies and of uh, working on, on common goals. Um, my impression so far is um, we've been kind of working side by side. There's not so much inter-cooperation. Mm -hmm. We did try to reach out a little bit. We even were in contact with the Free and, Sof uh, free and uh, Libre Software Foundation Europe. Is it there? Um, and um, and we, we found very open, friendly, nice people being in touch with us. We even had some people voluntarily um, getting active in the Framondo community. Um, just to say, Framondo is a business, but at the same time we've been driven by a lot of contributions by volunteers. And um, it's part of the strategy. We have a point system where you gather so-called fair founding points, which are basically have this are kind of um, shares that you earn by, um, by, uh, by working, by contributing work. 
so um, some kind of sweat equity, so called. Um, and in this, it actually created a little bit of tensions in our um, little team at the beginning um, because those people who are very much advocating free software were advocating it for for it at any at every stage, everything that we used. Um, <coughs> So we started using Linux computers um, or installing Linux on our computers. Um, we started using free software for basically everything internally. And uh, at some point, I realized that we spent more time kind of adapting solutions, in particular for project management and team coordination. Um, we spent a lot of time working on that tool. And at some point, I realized that even those like those members of our team who were actually working on our core marketplace software started working on our tools uh, for, for project management. And so basically we had to decide, no, we're going to use um, proprietary software for the moment because we don't have the capacity to, to contribute to this open source tools. And um, this again frustrated some other members who came from this uh, open source or free software movement. Do you have similar experiences in France? Yes, uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy that you uh, uh, distinguish between the two approaches that you could have and uh, because uh, I'm, I suppose everybody here knows the difference between free software and open source and, uh, because um, yeah, but, but because Having your the source code open is uh, is something, but uh, in my opinion, well, not in my opinion, in the opinion of uh, Richard Stallman, uh, free, soft, uh, free software is open source with uh, a purpose. So yes, a purpose to change society, while while open source is just uh, a methodology of driving uh, software development. So that changes everything. So. This is why even we, we will discuss it later, even if our licensing model may not be really free software. Uh, we are, uh, we em I think we embrace really more uh, the, the, the principles of free software. And about platform cooperativism, uh, I don't know when Fermondo was created, because, I don't know if it was created b before the term of uh, platform cooperativism was uh, popularized by uh, Trevor Scholz and uh, Nathan Schneider, but uh, at the beginning, in any case, ourselves, we didn't know anything about platform cooperatives, and we realized later that we were in this uh, movement, <laughs> actually. So, uh, and I think uh, platform cooperatives, it's an ugly word. I, I, I hope we will find uh, some other word one day, uh, but uh, because... Uh, <laughs> In French, it's uh, quite uh, impossible to pronounce, and um, um, uh, and uh, I think it's a reaction to uh, the 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 the, the so-called co collaborative platforms that emerged, like I think uh, what uh, five or six years ago, and uh, that had a lot of uh, promises uh, to, and that maybe at the beginning that were a little bit like. Uh, the principles of free software, so uh, Airbnb, uh, Uber, and all of that, they had lots of promises of self-organization of the people by themselves uh, to maybe to re reinvent the way work is uh, working. Uh, but in the end, uh, they ended up uh, being like a, a false promise because uh, more and more, they, they, they are behaving like uh, big, they are big corporations. Uh, and, they, uh, and so, my, in my opinion, platform cooperativism is maybe a reaction to this to tell, like, bring us back uh, the promise of the collaborative economy. Uh, like, uh, I don't know the history uh, of free software uh, completely, but uh, like, Free software was also a reaction to the same kind of things, like uh, uh, like big corporations like I IBM uh, wanting to make uh, proprietary software. So I think uh, yes, it's uh, the, the 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 it is in the same uh, idea because it's a, a kind of social movement too. 
So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for sharing these um, experiences. So um, for now, I think we've mostly focused on the user perspective on free software, where free software um, obviously offers uh, many advantages. So those four um, freedoms we have are also as a cooperative um, and how far you use um, free software. Um, I would like to shift the perspective now a bit to the producers or workers' perspective. Um, which seems to be a bit more, maybe, I don't know, controversial. And um, in the GNU Manifesto, Richard Stallman reacts to some uh, popular objections against free software principles. And one of those objections um, lies in the question whether uh, programmers will starve if they put their code under um, a free software license, and if it wouldn't be unfair if they won't get rewarded for their work. So. Um, to, um, to react on this objection, Stallman, Stallman argues that um, restricting copyright is not the only way of making money from producing software, though it might become less profitable when they put it under a free license. Um, I would like to know, um, Silvan, um, and how far is uh, free software uh, based on pay, unpaid or low-paid work, and which positions uh, are there within the FSFE about this? So how is the debate going, and what's your point? Of you. Uh, well, that, that's, that's always a controversial uh, discussion, of course, and I remember that uh, with one of our frequent local meetings in Berlin that happen every two weeks, uh, we once had the, uh, the discussion topic of how to make money with free software, and that was one of the best um, visited uh, meeting because everyone was like interested in, okay, what, what, what uh, strategies are there to make money from uh, free software? I can only agree with Richard Stallman, of course, by, by uh, restricting um, the use of your software, you can easily um, uh, utilize the, the, the copyright um, and, and profit from, uh, from selling the product of your work. I think uh, what, is, what lies at the bottom of uh, free software uh, producers is actually the service. Um, it's, it's not producing something that you can uh, sell off the shelf, but it's rather um, like I am, I am a programmer for my company and as I program uh, my software, I get paid for what I do and I'm, I, don't take, I don't get shares in every click that some of the users click when they use the software that I uh, program because by then I'm already working on the next project which I'm being paid for. Um, so uh, focusing on the service rather than, than the product is uh, one important thing and most software companies that uh, make money from uh, uh, from free software will argue that they uh, try to get service contracts or support contracts uh, with companies that use the free software because there's always um, work to do. Uh, as you say, there's administrative work, there's uh, config work. Uh, some people used to say Linux is only free if your time is worthless. Um, but that uh, focuses on the price of the software, right? And our, in English, uh, there is this, uh, this ambiguity, uh, and, uh, this ambiguity of, of meanings. Um, free as in free beer with no price, or free as in freedom, and no, ma no matter how much effort you have to put into the configuration or the administration of your free software, how much money you have to spend to use the free software as you wish, it always will stay free as in freedom. Thank you very much for clarifying this. So um, one strategy of um, still making money is to um, make money out of like services around software. Um, I would also like to know, um, Felix, you as a cooperative, I mean, somehow you always, you also um, produce software in the sense that there's a code uh, which makes Fermondo run. And um, I would like to know, um, and how far does that matter to Fermondo right now? And especially, and how far did it matter at the process of founding the cooperative? So um, was this an important issue for you? Who's going to write this code? Was this a financial problem or was it more like other problems which were more dominant. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, in short, developing an open source marketplace solution is an extremely complicated thing, very, very expensive to do. Um, in terms of software development, you just need a lot of, well, developer hours, so said. And um, 
So it's basically the bottleneck that almost broke our own neck. Um, we've been running through major crises in terms of uh, continuing our continuing to stay in business with our cooperative because we couldn't provide a, an, um, a proper product to our customers. We did have a lot of demand. We had a lot of sellers coming over from Amazon, from eBay, saying, great, finally um, an alternative marketplace that is ambitious enough to, to say we want to challenge, challenge those people. We never had a shortage of actually um, sellers and, and not just sustainable, ecologically minded sellers, but really just small producers, small sellers of any kind coming over and saying, okay, we're interested. But um, providing a proper product is another thing. And um, this yeah, software development is just a very, it's, it's basically in, um, bottomless in terms of uh, how much you can invest into this. Um, and my view on the whole question of um, how can you actually make money by creating a free product like our source code is free, it's on GitHub, um, others could use it. So far, nobody's really using it, um, I must say, um, just because it's too complicated to, to set up your own installation of it. Um, well, it's at least, we have a Farmondo um, branch or a second Farmondo cooperative set up in, in the UK since two years, and they basically didn't use our software so far because they didn't have the developer capacities to adapt our, pro our software for them. And um, so the, the question if you can get um, paid by providing this is a, is a core thing. And I think it's a problem, a general structural problem of how services are provided in the internet, um, in the online business in particular. I mean, we are an online platform, an online company, um, and um, customers and users are kind of expecting to get every service for free. So... Um, the marketplace has the advantage that uh, sellers are used to pay a little fee, so at least we can make money through our core business model and then use that money for developing software and paying developers. <clears throat> um, but I think we need a, an internet that is basically based on more transparent business models where we don't have this kind of fake free offers where you um, think, okay, I can use Google Maps and other... Google products, for example, for free, and you still pay with your data, and you pay um, by using the, or by clicking on their adver advertisements. Um, so we need a new structure there, I think, and maybe we can contribute to this. And yeah, okay, I can leave it. But <laughs> well, uh, uh, what I find interesting in your case is that uh, you have never um, started. Uh, your your business or your company with the goal of uh, selling software, right? Uh, so y you are not a software company. You just um, decided to uh, create your own tools, uh, create your own software, and I'm very happy about it. Uh, decided to share that software with others, even though 10 years later, or I don't know how many, uh, five years later, uh, it turns out that no one else is using it. Uh, so one could argue, of course, you could just as well have uh, kept it to yourself if no one's using it anyway. But uh, then again, if we uh, strive to um, create a more open, more transparent internet, and uh, if we even want to enable other cooperatives, like the one you mentioned in the UK, uh, or others that may open up in Brazil or Thailand or whatever, uh, then just uh, just the, 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 your offer of here's something. Not even if uh, not not only if you use exactly that, but um, here's something that you can look at, that you can study, that you can learn from, and uh, maybe there's something inside um, that we haven't even uh, noticed that might be of help uh, for you. So uh, yes, uh, uh, personally, um, I I see if. If um, a software, no, uh, some com some business, some company creates their own software um, and does not intend to sell it for money, I don't see why not every company should open up their code um, under a free license. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I wanted to ask you anyway. <laughs> I just maybe ask you a question, maybe, I don't know. Maybe. My question was actually that um, I think this idea of um, putting the code under a free, or at least um, somehow not proprietary license is 
a basic idea of co-op cycle and yeah, I would yeah, like yeah. to know about your experiences with um, yes. the usage of your code by other cooperatives. Yes, um, but uh, in, in, maybe I don't really remember, but, uh, but maybe uh, one of the main reasons uh, we created a free open source software is because of the, the nature of the kind of platforms we are trying to make an alternative to. It's because in the, the gig economy platform, like the, for delivering food, the, the, one of the, 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 the masters is the algorithm and nobody knows how the algorithm works. Nobody knows uh, why is uh, some gig attributed some, to some workers or not. So making the algorithm, which is the new boss today, the, today the algorithm is deciding if you have, for example, if you have four stars on Uber, you don't get assigned any gig and you are not earning money. Because if you are, have not given the small uh, bottle of water to the customer, it gives you four stars and then you don't get assigned any work anymore. So you have to be like a, a majordome, uh, like you have to, 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 um, to be uh, happy every day, you have to, to be like this to, for the customer, etc. And so the algorithms are the new bosses and now your boss is in your pocket, in your smartphone. Uh, on, on the gig economy platform. So nobody knows how it works. So one of the main reasons why, actually we don't have any algorithm anymore. We, we started making one really simple algorithm, but we cha completely changed the software afterwards. But one of the main reasons is that if the, the algorithm is, you can read, if you are able to read code, of course, if you are able to understand how the algorithm works, there is something uh, that is, uh, uh, is, is more open at least. But also I would like to emphasize about the fact that uh, will programmers starve? Is the, um, for, for example, in Linux, 8% uh, of the contributions are actually made by volunteers. All the other contributions are made by people paid to work for Intel, for IBM, for Red Hat, for example. So uh, no. <laughs> programmers are not going to starve at all. Or maybe they, they are going to starve one day, because right now we see the rise of uh, coding schools. Uh, they, want, they, they want people to learn programming at the age of five, and all of that, that sounds cool, but actually the, the main goal behind this is to, is to lower the wages for the programmers, because the programmers, they are still costing a lot of money to companies. In, in the United States, when you go out from, from the school, you can get paid like $100,000 a year, even as a junior programmer. And uh, all of these big companies, they want to pay the developers less. So uh, maybe, that, maybe the coding tools are going to lower the wages for developers. But, um, but yeah, we, we, we really started uh, uh, open source in a, we really started the, 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 the software open source in a maybe pragmatic way or just a maybe provocative way. Uh, but uh, now I, I really don't think uh, programmers will start. No, 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 no problem. Maybe can I? I can jump in right there. I mean, I think you very beautifully described before in your, in your statement before that there are a lot of similarities in, in how these movements have started, both of them, the cooperativism movement, also the free software movement. And I and I think a big question that I always ask myself is that, that there's also always, or that there's similar dangers in both movements of, of how they could be co-opted. I mean, again, I, and uh, you kind of addressed this a little bit in your last statement where you said that um, actually a lot of them are employed by, by IBM. And, and, and for you, Zivan, just, just a question. As I understand it, actually most of the free software, um, that the most programs that work on it, they are actually employed by, by the big tech companies, by, by Google, by Facebook, by Amazon, by IBM. And, and why is that the case? What is actually the interest of these big companies in, in pushing for the development of free software? What is going on there? 
Uh, well, I think they're just using, they're sharing the same tool, right? Um, so uh, one big example for me, apart from the Linux kernel, of course, um, was always a, a software uh, a development platform, like the, like the program you use to program software, uh, software programs. And of course, there are a lot of companies who have the have demand for for such a piece of software and a development environment, right? And uh, then. I mean, in earlier days, maybe they would have put up a consortium or something and decided to work together uh, so that they can all use the same uh, the same tool. Uh, nowadays, with the means of uh, free software, they can they can they can just put the repository online, and then people are free to contribute or uh, to just take it and use it for themselves. Um, so, uh, why are so many uh, people are actually being paid? It's an interesting que question, right? Uh, first, we were worried that uh, developers may may starve. Now we ask ourselves, what makes these company actually uh, pay developers to produce uh, free software? And and I think uh, the main answer is just that they uh, want to use software as a tool and. Um, and in a, in a market society, uh, there's nothing to say against uh, the fact that we are all using the same tools. I mean, carpenters, they have all used the same tools. And if they have had had, had a machine to copy their tools, why, why would, they, would they have used it? Um, with software, we can, we can do that easily. And, and it doesn't um, give them a, a, a negative impact on, on their business. Um, to share the software that they're using. Okay. I mean, we've had a similar debate kind of, so I want to address um, or kind of bring a similar question to the cooperative field because, because there, this question of cooptation has also been raised a lot, uh, especially in Germany in the, in, in the last month because Trevor Scholz, I think you've, you've mentioned him before a couple of uh, minutes ago, who's kind of seen as, as one of the figureheads of this cooperativism movement. He's written a lot of books just for those of you who don't know him. And Google has actually uh, given him a $1 million grant, um, I think in May of this year, in order to develop, a, a, I think they call it a, a platform cooperative uh, development kit or tool or something and, and, and my question to you is is, is, is that co-optation is there a danger actually of this of this movement which had had this kind of emancipatory strategy in the beginning supposedly uh, to be co-opted by these big tech giants why are they interested in that why does Google give one one million dollars to um, to Trevor Schultz what's going on to you first Felix <laughs> well First, Trevor is, is a great and very committed guy, and I'm absolutely sure that he is not co-opted co and, and not co-optable as a person, as a personality. He puts so much effort into spreading this concept, and um, I really appreciate this. Um, and I think the Google grant was an opportunity. He's been reaching out um, to a lot of institutions, a lot of potential partners. Um, that's also, also one of his strengths. Uh, he has a good network and is a good networker. Um, so first, uh, at first view, I'd, I'd say, okay, great, if they contribute some money and you have to see that um, they do give a grant, but it's also connected to some conditions. Those co-ops that can be supported with this or, well, funded with this grant are mostly co-ops that work in the health business or elderly care business. So nothing that could affect the core business model of, of Google. Um, yeah, that's the one point. Um, I think co-optation is a, is a core danger for any ambitious, um, um, ethically motivated business or, or organization. Um, it's, it's, it's happening so much, and in particular, if you grow to a scale where you get relevant, where people think, okay, now you're making a turnover where you can, or revenues where you can actually, um, well, make some profits with it, um, you're very much in danger of being taken over or pushed into a a direction that you maybe didn't intend in the beginning. That's why I think we need throughout platform co-ops with a, with a dedicated model that prevents this, this kind of what I, I called an un uncorruptible business. Mm. Um, that's why we developed this, what we called a cooperative 2.0 model, because the cooperative model, in my view, is also, first of all, outdated, and second, not perfectly pre uh, preventing this kind of co-optation. Um, what does it do, the cooperative 2.0? What's the difference to cooperative 1.0? So Why very is it short. less corruptible? <laughs> so first of all, it's about who can be your member and how can you be a member. Um, so I think co-ops, platform co-ops and, and any 
progressive co-op should be a multi-stakeholder co-op where employees can be members, users can be members, but other affected people that are affected by your business and your activities should also be able to become member and hold you to account. Um, you should clearly define the principles of, uh, of your work and not just having a nice mission statement, but really concrete, specific principles. For example, we have the principle that we have to publish all knowledge produced by our cooperative uh, under a kind of GPL license, um, not just code, but also other knowledge. And um, I think these kind of principles, you need to put them down and then be able to be held to account. And from this requires also transparency. So you also need to have transparency measures. Um, you can you know, explain a lot of things that you're going to do, and then um, nobody really knows what you're doing. Um, yeah, so these are core issues about Corp 2.0. What do you say to that? Um, first of all, I mean, we want to open up um, the floor to all of you out there. Just one last question to also give you the possibility to respond, but maybe maybe about this cooptation question, but also how did you license your code as Coop Cycle, and and why? What kind? What what measures did you choose? Maybe if you could answer these two questions, and then afterwards we'll open up up to yes. all of you. First of all, uh, maybe uh, ironically, uh, the the big corporations have uh, decided to own the means of production, which are, for example, Microsoft buying GitHub, because nowadays <laughs> most of the code is uh, produced on GitHub. So they, they say, OK, those are the means of production of what we are, we are using. Let's buy it. And also IBM has bought Red Hat recently. So uh, while this may be quite, uh, yeah, uh, quite uh, frightening because of the, yes, the concentration into the hands of always the same big corporations having big money and all of that, normally it should say it should stay uh, more or less uh, like before. Yes, Linux, while it is uh, supported mainly by big companies, it's still uh, something that is free. The, to, but it may, it, of course, it may be influenced a little bit by the interests of the, the, the big companies, which are, of course, improving the software. Also, for example, Facebook has made React, which is a wonderful, uh, which is a wonderful framework. So uh, also, they, they are it's benefiting the, the, the community, because React allows to buy, to build uh, wonderful websites. We are using uh, it to make the, the our native app, so I, I couldn't say that they are they are bad. But uh, so it's, yeah, it's it's a complicated situation because we live in a capitalist world, and so you have to. It was about the same uh, issue about programmers starving. You need to have money to live. So uh, if you don't have money, you, uh, if you are not earning money, you need to have money on the bank. I don't know, but uh, you you need money to buy food. To uh, rent an apartment, so you, you you need money. So I, I but and money has no. Uh, I don't know if you say that in English. Uh, money has no. You um, um, don't care where money comes from, but uh, <laughs> the, it depends on if the 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 people giving you the money can influence what you do. And normally, like, like you said, uh, one of the difference uh, between us and uh, maybe GitHub and uh, Red Hat is that cooperatives cannot be acquired. Mm -hmm. They cannot, We cannot buy, uh, so because uh, GitHub is a standard company. It's a company is seeking profit. It's a company, it's not driven by uh, any idea. It's uh, just a, a capitalist company. And uh, Red Hat is, was also, is also a, a company like this. So maybe one of the differences is that uh, with cooperatives, at least no, no big corporation can buy it, but yes, also as a last remark, yes, maybe, uh, but of course cooperative is not the, the, the last solution because, for example, in Italy, uh, cooperatives have a very bad image because uh, basically people are creating cooperatives just to benefit from uh, tax advantages. And uh, so <laughs> I've been in Italy, and when you say cooperative to the young people, you say, "Oh no, <laughs> no, 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 come on, I don't, I don't want that." And uh, all of that, and yeah, to end up with uh, the our licensing model. Uh, so since the beginning, uh, yes, it, it was maybe a joke at the beginning. Now it's part of the our ideology, I would say. Uh, 
uh, in the beginning, uh, when the project was really small, small, uh, I chose a license, which is the peer production license, which was written by uh, a German, uh, uh, German activist from a telecommunistan uh, group. Uh, which, and this license, basically, it says uh, that you, are, or you have almost all the four liberties except the one to use the software in any way you want. So see, this license, it says that to use the software, you need to be a worker and uh, company. You need to implement democracy in the company and you need to uh, uh, split the profits between all the workers. So it's just a way to say uh, you need to be a cooperative to run uh, the, the, the software. So at, when I saw this license, which is named like copy, it's not copy left, it's copy far left. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, really, I really liked it uh, <laughs> because of the name. So, and, uh, but really at the beginning it was not really serious. It was just to, uh, because I was the only one uh, following myself on GitHub. So uh, that was not... <laughs> Uh, so uh, and now, but now it's part of what we of really we we actually we are encoding our ideology in the license because, for example, Linus Torvalds one day he said uh, in 2002 he said ideology sucks and I don't I don't agree with him. So he said the, the world will be a better place with less I ideology and more programming for fun. But that's like saying I'm neither left nor right. When people say that, they are, uh, they are right wing. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, and for example, one, one last example, last summer, and I think, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not really uh, a specialist of all of this, but I think this debate has been there in the free software open source community. It's like saying, who are the bad guys? Can, can't we say who are the bad guys? The bad guys, they are the, the ones spying on us, they are the ones uh, making shit with the refugees and all of that. For example, uh, last summer, people from the Lerna project, which is a, a tool to manage JavaScript mono repo, they added a clause to their license saying that you can't use our software if you are working with the immigration agency. So if you are Palantir, Microsoft, IBM, you cannot use our software. And it was. Uh, the debate uh, was around that. So we do more or less the same thing. We, we, want to, uh, we really want to say, yes, the bad guys are the people uh, living only for profit, and et cetera, and they, they should make cooperative. So Thank you. Very you, you, you want to jump in? I felt like four minutes ago. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of content added afterwards, but, but, but please yeah, try to briefly can, no, address yeah. these questions, I can, and afterwards uh, want to open it up. Yeah, so, right. I, can, uh, I can answer to that very, very briefly, because <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate the way uh, you, uh, you said what, what you just did. But um, from the point of view of these two paths that I offered in the beginning, I must say, by, by choosing your path of restricting the use of the software, you're leaving the path of freedom. Um, so what, what, what your license does is not offering free software, and so we, here we are separating. So now we have a clear division, which is always good to, uh, to trigger some debate. So let's open it up to all of you. Um, uh, Zantje is going to collect the questions. We would like to take three questions at a time, and then whoever wants to, wants to address them first can address them first. So please, hands up. Uh, if you have something to say, uh, please make it brief and in question form. Thanks a lot. Yeah, here, down. Uh, there's one down here. There's another one here in the middle, and one over there. So, one, two, and a third one. Yeah, we would uh, especially like to have a also, especially here, a gender balance at least. Yeah, if we don't please have compensate. It on the, so, um, okay, let's have these two questions first, and then we will do a second round. If no one's, don't be shy. Okay, let's go. Um, so first of all, thanks. Um, I was just curious in, in terms of cooperatives uh, and, and stakeholders which have, I would say, competing interests. Uh, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with decision making, uh, with finding consensus and, and that sort of thing? Next one. Down here. There's the second one here. Ah. Okay, first of all, um, thank you very much. That was very interesting. 
Uh, one thing I would like to add, um, I was missing two points maybe on how to get paid for the work for free software. Uh, one answer is don't, yeah, because <laughs> what you get is respect. Um, that's like an ultimate currency and you can do a lot more things with that than with the uh, little money you will get uh, for the little bit of coding. Uh, also, if you code open source, yeah, you have uh, an incredible code base these days. Um, compare that to 10 years ago with proprietary software, um, it was would be unfinanceable um, the amount of code you can use now. But my question is, um, uh, how do you um, how does data ownership fit in all into this? Because you haven't talked about that. There used to be a time where we owned the software and we owned the data, and now we own neither. Yeah. So that's my question. Anyone wants to go first uh, from those on the on the panel? So Felix, you want to go? Yeah, sure, of course. Well, on that first question. Um, Governance is a specific issue and to me, cooperative doesn't define your governance model. You do have accountability to your stakeholders in our model, for example, um, but they don't rule our all-day business. Um, we have a team that, that has taken its own decisions and, and our cooperative members can basically make sure that we follow up the principles that we put there. Um, we do have a general assembly that then can discuss and also influence general strategic decisions, but not all day business. So it's not about having like balancing all these stakeholders all the time. I, I think that actually doesn't make sense to do it in all day business. But then for, for general questions like, for example, the pricing on, um, on the platform, we, we need the input from the different groups. Um, what is a, yeah, but, this is a specific thing. I just wanted to also mention, like, since uh, the question of, of data ownership and data was mentioned, data protection maybe also, um, for me, the, it's one of the core reasons why we need this platform co-op movement and why we also need the free software movement and why we need to work together. Right now, we are in a very dangerous situation and in a very pressing situation of recapturing the internet and all this technology that's out there. I mean, this is what this conference is about. Um, if we don't do it, we will follow the path of being manipulated into consuming more by using our data. And um, I don't think that any classical corporate model is uh, useful for creating um, well-designed well, well data protection. I think we need to create this kind of democratic control, not just through abstract governments, but within the businesses. Um, yeah. Thanks. Anybody else wants to jump in on these two questions? Well, yeah, I just think that that uh, goal probably doesn't work without free software, right? Uh, so the, the question of data ownership, of course, goes to the businesses who own the data or who have the data. Um, but if you want to be pr uh, transparent, you just cannot have some piece of software that's doing with your data whatever you cannot control, with, control it. So I think we can do maybe one or two last questions. Are there any further questions from the audience? Let's start here, there, and there. Um, so, I was talking earlier about um, the restriction of use and what the potential consequences of that could be. And um, one of the ideas that came to mind was that we restrict um, freedoms for corporations in many ways, that we don't restrict for people. And I'm wondering if you would, so it sounds like some of the restrictions that are being proposed are restrictions for sort of organizations, not necessarily for individual users. And if you just wanted to comment on that. Wait a second question down here somewhere. Can you, uh, yeah, over there. Yes, I am Jan Peter from Host Sharing Co-op and uh, we, uh, we we offering uh, web hosting on our own servers and our own infrastructure since 18 years. And I just wanted to hear uh, what do you think about uh, owning owning not only your company but only having an infrastructure of co-ops owning servers and infrastructure. Vitalik Buterin, the founder of the Ethereum Foundation, argues that, public, uh, that free software can only be a public good if the developer community is diverse. How can we achieve that the developer community of free software gets more non-white and non-male? 
Okay, three uh, very interesting questions. Um, I, I will take you first if you, if you, if you want to address them. Uh, okay, yeah, go, go ahead. And then afterwards. Yes, about the, yes, the, uh, having a common infrastructure, I think this, this is one of the things we are uh, trying to do because, uh, yes, we, our, uh, uh, our software is, uh, okay, open source, <laughs> maybe. Uh, uh, but uh, in, the, in the platform economy, one of the, and, and maybe it's also related with data, uh, in the platform economy, the, the, the software, the, the, the lines of code are not the problem. The lines of code are just useless if they don't run on the server. So, uh, the, 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 and this is what the, 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 the big platforms have uh, achieved. It's, uh, it's uh, making services that are running pretty well uh, on the internet. For example, in France, there is a, 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 a non-profit organization named uh, Framasoft, which uh, brings, uh, we try to, to, to de-googleize, like they say, so they are, basically they are putting open source uh, alternatives to what Google is uh, doing in uh, their servers and give it, give it for free. So it's, it, it's infrastructure is really a, a big issue and it also relates to, uh, to uh, big corps because uh, like I think uh, like more than half of the servers in the internet are run by Amazon, which means that uh, on your data uh, even if you are running an uh, ethical company, your data is on the, the servers, is physically on the servers of Amazon. So uh, they could do what they want uh, with it. And uh, yes, maybe there is a, uh, about, I, I'm not a specialist of the, the, this subject because uh, also data is a, is, a, is a matter of infrastructure. You have to have lots of uh, storage to, 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 to store it, etc. And uh, uh, there was uh, an article uh, a few days ago, uh, I think, about nationalizing Amazon, but I don't think nationalizing Amazon is a good idea because if the data is owned by the state, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an issue too. So maybe cooperatives and publicly owned uh, by the people uh, stuff uh, is the, the way to go So uh, about this subject. Thank you very much. Would you like to uh, continue? Yeah, your question was that about um, how we can use free software to keep uh, to, uh, to, to uh, d um, allow cooperatives to use it, but disallow co co companies or co um, corporations uh, to use it, um, or single persons, I guess. Uh, um, so to yes, oh, well, I think the answer is we cannot. I mean, we cannot with free software, and and if there are companies who are doing certain things that we consider to be bad, um, we have to stop them doing it, but writing a piece of software and disallowing them to use it for their purposes is not the way to go, right? It's like uh, creating a pen um, and, and allowing everyone to do whatever they want to do uh, with it except uh, signing, signing a war treaty. If I decide to uh, produce a pen, then I must allow my users to write whatever they want. I cannot. Uh, I'm, uh, we, would, we would stretch copyright, right? The whole idea of free software is based on copyright um, because when I create a piece of software, it's up to me to decide how, um, uh, who, can, who can copy it, who can give it away, who can use it. But it would be rather strange to try and decide um, how the software can be used because that would be like writing a book and saying you can use that information that I wrote into that book for anything except uh, going to war. Um, that's just not possible, right? If, uh, if, we, if we decide to write free software, then uh, the first strict principle that we have to stick to is freedom of use, and it is not our um, responsibility uh, what, people are use, uh, what, what people are using the software for. Thank you very much. So um, do you also want to react to the questions or...? Yeah, maybe diversity. just the question on the diversity um, very quickly. I mean, diversity is an issue that I think is, is very deeply rooted in society and there are reasons why maybe more male people are, are becoming coders and I think it's actually changing. I mean, we've, we've been talking about it, I think, in the main panel yesterday night also they mentioned that. Um, well, it's still, I think, like businesses like ours, cooperatives like ours, we can do our efforts uh, to try to diversify our team. Um, 
And we, we did, but it also depends on do we have the resources to actually do it? Um, or are we depending on whoever comes and, and wants to join us? And we certainly don't exclude someone who says, I, I want to join you guys. And we don't say, okay, you're male, white, please go out. You know, like that, that we can't do. But we can try to encourage, and I think, yeah, we did try that. Uh, yeah, I think it's very similar with us because in our local meetings, I mean, if, if 15 people show up and two of them are women, uh, that's a lot already. And, uh, and we have a problem there. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. The only answer that I can think of is that the, the solution to that problem is probably with us men, in terms of the gender uh, question, with us men, it's, it's our responsibility to... Um, uh, um, to create a atmosphere and situation that more women want to join us, and it's not as easy as just saying, "Well, we are looking at our group, and the women women are just not coming." Uh, so, uh, this is my um, what is appell in English? Uh, um, my this is my call to all the white uh, men out there. You, please, uh, please. Uh, 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 create a situation and an atmosphere that more women uh, and or a more diverse uh, a group of people feels comfortable. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we are, I think we're opening up a second uh, panel, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, we are. So um, this already sounded like a nice uh, final statement. Um, however, I would like to give the chance to every one of you to uh, to say two uh, two final sentences about. Um, your key takeaways from the panel, if you want to, it's voluntarily. Um, and um, yeah, I would like to maybe start over there if there's. Okay, so as I said, I think this is a very pressing issue. I think we um, need to focus our resources to actually create pilot projects that are visible and, and attracting mainstream and I then also have the capacities and resources to be more inclusive and, um, and attract more people that maybe are more dependent on actually getting a well-paid job, like yeah, just people who are now marginalized and don't have much money and just need a, need a job and maybe can't volunteer. Um, then the learning for me is that um, I'm I'm still more supportive of the free software approach and I do think that we have to collaborate more. And this is a general thing, there's not enough corporations in, the, in all of these scenes and movements that are, uh, that are out there. I think we are much too, um, well, much too focused on our own silos. Um, yeah, so this is actually also a call. Let's join together, let's join our forces. Um, with Famondo, certainly we need partners. We also need uh, more activists helping us. Um, right now, we urgently need people. So anyone who's interested, just contact me, felix at Um And also, whatever you do, let's work together. Um, let's try to make it big. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, two last sentences. Yes. Uh, well, what I would say is like, uh, the, so software has been eating the world for a few years already, and uh, like uh, the, the world was uh, pronounced around here. We are in the era of uh, platform capitalism. So, uh, and uh, in face of climate change, I believe that uh, platform cooperatives can make a difference because they can focus on something else than profit. So, they can focus on maybe uh, ecological issues. Uh, way more than uh, profit-oriented <laughs> companies. And um, yeah, also, uh, I w we, we will discuss later, uh, because I, I fairly believe uh, that uh, wh what, what, what we are doing in, in a philosophical uh, way is uh, really more uh, uh, near uh, of open so uh, to free software than to open source. Uh, because I really prefer Richard Salman than to Eric uh, Raymond. And uh, so, yes, but uh, I, I mean, the, 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 we, we have to adapt to our uh, epoch, uh, to our era, and maybe what was answered at a certain uh, time are not adapted today. So maybe... Uh, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not uh, the, 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 the four principles of free software 
are not allowed uh, edicted by God. So, <laughs> so that's uh, just uh, my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. And um, also your final statement. Yeah, well, yeah as free, free software advocates, we always have to live with the situation that the bad guys don't know us, right? And they don't uh, know what free software is all about. And that's a hard situation. But uh, here in the context of Bits and Bäumer, we found that sometimes even the good guys don't know us. And so I want to uh, share, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I love to be here, and I think that more of the good guys should use more free software. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming.